here today, Rohit rides the Triumph Street Triple R at the Jerez Racetrack in Spain. Some 360 donuts served by David Coulthard at the Red Bull Mumbai show run. And we ride a new cruiser motorcycle from Kiwi, ready to battle in a space dominated by Harley Davidsons and Triumph motorcycles. Hello and welcome to Overdrive, I'm Soini Dutt. It's very hard to find faults with Triumph's three triple range of motorcycles and yet for 2023, Triumph has made their motorcycles a lot more powerful and sharper than before. Rohit got a chance to ride the Street Triple R in Spain recently and he tells us why these incremental changes make this motorcycle a convincing buy for 2023. The circuit of Jerez in Spain, it's an iconic MotoGP track. It is where a lot of battles have been fought, especially this last corner. It's seen some epic battles. Rossi versus Gibanao, Lorenzo versus Marquez. Now, this track is also very important for this company, Triumph. Why? Well, they became the official engine supplier for Moto2 with their 765 and they started testing it. The first time the test happened was in 2019 at this very track. So, that's the reason why the new Street Triple has been given to us at Heret. Super sport machines are unfortunately a dying breed and it's a pity that despite being at the peak of their racing involvement, Triumph have axed the Daytona for good. So if you still want to go racing with a middleweight Triumph Triple, your only option is the Street Triple RS, a very accomplished motorcycle that is back in a practically all new Avatar for 2023. And it has even brought along an even twin in the stunning Moto2 edition, which unfortunately is sold out and will not make it to India. Coming back to the Street Triple RS, it is now the range topper now that the Moto2 editions are sold out worldwide. Compared to the base Street Triple R, the RS can be identified with its exclusive paint options like the wine red seen here. The belly pan and the bar end mounted wing mirrors are another giveaway that this is the RS. But both these components can also be retrofitted on the R. Now you may not notice it visually, however, the rear end of the motorcycle has been lifted slightly compared to the regular Street Triple R. Now what they've done is they have a spacer on top of the rear suspension that gives it this angle. Also the rake angle is, is much sharper now. So essentially the seat height has gone up by 10 millimeters. So it is a bit of a perch, like is the case with the Speed Triple as well, but the narrower tank and the narrower seat makes the Street Triple RS quite friendly. However, if you think that 836 millimeters of seat height is going to be quite tall, well, you can always remove that spacer and get the seat to go down again. With the sharper rake, you also get a shorter wheelbase, a marginally shorter wheelbase on the RS compared to the R. So what that essentially means is, because it's a more aggressive riding Porsche, you're putting more weight on the front, so the front doesn't feel too floaty, it will not wheelie that easily despite the shorter wheelbase. And because the wheelbase is shorter, it also means that the bike feels quite stable even through the corners, it still feels quite agile, even if you're putting a lot of weight on the front, there's still enough traction. Corner instability is amazing. In fact, I don't remember when was the last time I was laughing so much inside my helmet with a middleweight naked. What allows you to push the bike harder still is the new suit of electronics which now use a 6-axis IMU from Continental. It brings along stuff like wheelie control but more importantly there is a less intrusive traction control system now which works discreetly on the road as we found out on the Street Triple R and even on the track you won't see the traction control light coming on that often. The RS also goes a step ahead with the track mode which allows the bike to have a certain degree of slip before the traction control will kick in. There's also a revised gearbox with a taller first and shorter subsequent gears. The low-end torque isn't as on tap as a KTM 790 or 890 Duke, but that also means the Street Triple continues to feel easy to ride to the groceries. While on the track, the mid-range pull is exceptional and allows you to ride in higher gears without falling out of the power band 
or without messing up the drive out of corners. We had three 20-minute sessions at the track and even as I picked up pace, there was no brake fade to complain about. By the third session, we also got a stiffer suspension setup that, coupled with the track time, allowed me to exploit higher lean angles and faster corner exits. You could also dial up the stiffness on the suspension because now you also have stickier rubber, the Pirelli Super Corsa SP version 3. So what that gives you is much better confidence even if you are running a much stiffer setup. In a nutshell then, I would say that if you've been missing the option of having a cracker of a middleweight motorcycle now that most of the 600s are dead or discontinued, I think the Street Triple 765 RS will suit your purpose, whether you're riding on the road or the track or a bit of both. Because this motorcycle is a phenomenal package and a great balance between the two. I think even though I know the R is going to be the, the higher selling variant that's going to be the more popular choice, if I had to spend my money or if I had to recommend a street triple to someone today, it would be the RS. Because that superior suspension, the superior brakes, which are ideally track bred, they also work superbly on the road. It just feels like a nicer package compared to the R. I don't want to take anything away from the R. I think it's the most value for money offering in the Street Triple lineup, but the RS is the one you want to spend that extra money on. This is the one to go for if you had to choose between the two. It's time to head into a very quick break here on the show, but coming up on the other side, 13-time Grand Prix winner David Coulthard brings some serious F1 action in Mumbai City. Sebastian Vettel won his second consecutive Formula 1 World Championship title with the Adrian Newey designed RB7 right here. This is powered by a 2.4 litre V8 and very soon Mumbai cars are going to get a chance to listen to this car live here, right here in Mumbai, all thanks to former Formula 1 driver David Coulthard. The last time Indians saw a Formula 1 race car burn some rubber on Indian city streets was eight years ago when David Coulthard created magic at the F1 show run in Hyderabad. But Mumbai cars hadn't heard the roar of a V8 since Kulthard's much talked about flat out drive through the Bandawali ceiling in 2009. 13 years later, it's fair to say we were more than ready to give our eyes and ears an F1 treat all thanks to 13-time Grand Prix winner turned F1 pundit and TV presenter David Kulthard. David, welcome to India. 13 years later, how has the trip been so far? been fantastic because uh, not only have I had the opportunity as you mentioned to discover a little bit of your amazing country in previous visits uh, it, I've seen now how the interest is growing in Formula One and just you know th this is a, a, a vibrant growing uh, economy and I think it's important that to be a true world championship Formula One should be back here in India. Would you attribute the you know the importance of the sport today with like a show like Drive to Survive on Netflix because a lot of people think they know more of the drivers and the teams you know what's going on behind it would you attribute the popularity to that? Yeah I think that what the whole Netflix phenomenon because it has been a phenomenon yeah. how it's excited such a, a change in the younger generation especially and, yeah. and a lot of young girls yeah. and young women yeah. have really been connecting with Formula One in a way through the personalities the drivers the way they yeah. interact the team principles and that was something that in historically in Formula One we never really got the chance to show because it was the race yeah. and the drivers race with a helmet and you don't see their faces and they get out afterwards and go, hey, I'm happy, and it's all kind of generic. Yeah. This is really given an opportunity to see them behind the scenes, and um, a lot of other sports now are, are uh, also trying to replicate that kind of access. All right, and you started your career when the V12 era was pretty much yeah. still on the grid. You drove through the V10 and the V8, and today we have the V6 um, turbo hybrid era. Have you had a chance to drive the V6 uh, cars of yeah. late, and what was your favorite era? Yeah, I drove the, the V6 uh, hybrid, and what's really different from the, this generation of car is the, the torque, the initial reaction. Anyone who has an electric car will get super excited. Yeah. You push the power and something happens yeah. straight away. Well, I really enjoyed uh, the early era of my career, the V10, mm -hmm. the wide track, slick tire cars. 
a lot of my career through regulation change was yeah. on these narrow track, uh, you know, 98 onwards. They had groove tires, which was to reduce the contact patch right. to try and slow the speeds in the corners. All of that worked in achieving what the regulations, you know, our governing body is the FIA. Yeah. But it didn't give the best driving experience. It's still Formula One. Mm. If you win, you're still happy. Mm. But I really enjoyed, let's say, the 95, uh, 1995 car that I raced in the early part of my Formula One career, just because it felt big and powerful and a lot of grip. And um, it, it, to me, represented my image of Formula One when I was growing up. Right, because it's a lot of downsizing ever since then, right? Yeah. So I don't want it to be politically correct about, <laughs> you know, it has to be fuel efficient yeah. and we are in that era. But back in 2005, when Red Bull entered Formula One, yeah. there were a lot of skeptics who said, you know, an en energy drink company in Formula One. Do you think you took a gamble back then? Or do you think, you know, of, of course, history tells another story today. Yeah, of course. So a lot of people would think, how can an energy drinks manufacturer compete with the, the automotive makers? Your Ferraris have got yeah. history in Formula One since the beginning. Mercedes, Breno and Honda and companies like that. Well, what I had already been in Formula One long enough to realize is it's not the name above the door that gives you success. Mm. If that was, then probably Ferrari is the biggest name yeah. in Formula One. It's the people. Yeah. And you've got to have the right people. And in uh, Red Bull, Mr. Marischitz, who sadly passed away last year, he had a passion for Formula One, for motorsport. He, he needed to market his product and the two could work very well. He didn't like to just be a sponsor because then you're at the, the whim of, of the management and, and, and the people who own the team. Right. So he had the financial resolve to own. And then he had the commitment to say to Christian, to myself, to everyone who was there at the beginning of that journey and say, okay, you're, you're the people who know about Formula One. What mm. do we need? Mm. And it was fantastic. Way back in 2009, when you came down to India, you crossed the speed limit yeah. at the Bandrawali ceiling. Yeah. Have you paid that fine yet or are you planning to compound it this weekend? Well, I haven't seen anyone come to me from the, uh, the, the, the police or whoever who handles that. But, yeah, it was, it was, of course, an opportunity to uh, go onto the, the, the C-Link and yeah. go a little bit quicker than what the, the regulations would allow. But uh, I, think, I think they've maybe just parked that fine. <laughs> and boy, were the streets packed with Oracle Red Bull racing fans who were pouring in from all across the city to catch a glimpse of the legendary Scott in a championship winning car. My name is Ame Nikam and I've come here all the way from Pune. Uh, I just wanted to watch a Formula 1 car from a long time, so that was a great experience for me. I'm from Pune and I came all the way to Mumbai just to see a glimpse of uh, the Red Bull racing, so we are really excited. If there's one thing the Oracle Red Bull racing team is famous for, other than dominating race weekends of course, is putting together unforgettable shows. And that's exactly what DC went on to do across the iconic Bandra Bandstand sea face for close to 25,000 spectators. Uh, I loved the show. The show was amazing. He did a donut. It was really, really amazing. I really liked the show. I'm really glad that that was a part of this in India and I think the F1 culture is going to build a lot. If there's anything we've learned from the show run today is that India has plenty of F1 fans and we are definitely ready for an Indian GP. Coming up shortly, we ride the Kiwi V302 seat cruiser bike. Stay with us, you're watching Overdrive. Welcome back, you're watching Overdrive. Chinese owned Hungarian brand Kiwi is all set to enter the cruiser motorcycle space to battle it out with the Harley Davidsons and Triumph motorcycles with their expensive offering the V302C motorcycle. Now, is this brand a digestible option though? Chris will tell us more. Seeing as you live out here in India and you fancied yourself a nice compact V-twin, a belt-driven motorcycle, well, you'd have to look at brands like Harley Davidson and Indian Motorcycle. Uh, at least out here in the country and yes you'd have to be willing to shed more than 10 lakh rupees for those motorcycles well that was until kiwi came out with this cruiser motorcycle you see before you this is the v302c cruiser what makes it so special what's it all about we are here to find out 
A twin cylinder belt driven motorcycle in this displacement category is rare and uncommon, and so is this motorcycle's styling. The V302C looks healthy and muscular, big yet compact. It really catches your eye, this one. Alright, maybe not so much so in this all black paint, but you do get the drift. When it's standing still, looking at this bike with its bulky teardrop shaped fuel tank, the wide handlebar with its tiny end mirrors, those cut short fenders with meaty tyres, the substantially sized upside down fork up front with the oil damp twin shocks at the rear, it all makes this bike look very compact, muscular and neat. Well, all that aside from those gaudy looking bunch of wires up front. It appears put together very nicely too, aside from the small gap between the seat and the tank. But that's more down to a design rather than an assembly flaw. The V302C is like a mix of a bobber motorcycle and a shrunken down Harley Davidson power cruiser. It doesn't look like any motorcycle of its engine capacity and it doesn't feel so when you get down to riding it as well. Alright, so the Kiwi V302C, as you can see, is a very nice and compact motorcycle. In fact, its wheelbase is just around 1420 mm, which is much shorter than something like the Royal Enfield Super Meteor 650 and even something like the Java 42 Bobber for that matter. Uh, now, if you notice, there are some pillion foot pegs out here behind me, but when it comes to seating area, well, the seating space for your pillion, very negligible. And although Kiwi say that there is a pillion backrest in the works, well, if you wanted to buy this motorcycle and wanted to seat a pillion behind you, well, that's pretty much out of the question. Yes, this bike does have its design hiccups. But then again, if you're the sort who'd probably choose to ride alone, you would have a good deal of fun with this motorcycle because although it's low, a tad long and has a radius that isn't really all the best, it is just so lively and enjoyable in its every demeanor. It rides on chunky tyres and the bike feels nicely balanced with you seated just 690mm off the ground in the centre of it all. So this allows you to feel and alter the course of this bike very nicely. But you will have to watch out for deep ruts and oddly shaped breakers because, well with the clearance just being around 158mm, well the base of the bike will scrape quite easily. Feel at the bars is quite neutral when you really want to get going. But Kiwi holds its line with poise around long sweeping bends. Yes, the suspension is set up stiff and you will feel the brunt of practically every bump on the road. But then again, what did you expect from a motorcycle of this sort? If you're looking for a cruiser that will breeze you over bumps and undulations like you're seated on some sort of magic carpet, well, look elsewhere. But I should say that this definitely isn't the most uncomfortable single-seater cruiser bike out there currently. For me, the best thing about this bike has to be its engine. A real highlight of this Kiwi Cruiser has to be its 298cc liquid-cooled V-twin. Now this works very well in tandem with the 6-speed gearbox and of course it is belt-driven. That means uh, its maximum power which is 29.5 PS and uh, maximum torque which is around 26.5 Nm. Well, Power delivery, torque delivery is just spread so well across the power band. The engine is very tractable at low speeds and out on the highway, cruising along at 100 kmph at just below 6000 rpm without a worry in the world. Uh, the engine just humming along very nicely and you will also have much power on hand to carry out a couple of overtakes after that. So that is a real highlight for me with this particular machine. The motor makes weaving through traffic an absolute breeze and the harder you rev, the nicer this bike feels and sounds. And the good thing about all of this is that the tyres and the brakes combo brings this bike to a halt very nicely too. So the Kiwi 302C comes across as a more than decent option in terms of its design, ride and handling. But then again, when you consider its list of features, you will feel shortchanged especially with its lack of Bluetooth connectivity and rather dull looking instrument console. You do get a sweet looking LED headlamp up front that does its job very well when the sun goes down and you do have dual channel ABS as well. But then this bike misses out on the traction control system that the BD300 that's sold in China gets. It all just doesn't justify the bike's steep asking price. 
So there's just one trim variant of this Keyway Cruiser to be had, but you do have the option of three colorways. Now the cheapest of which is the grey colour scheme, which this motorcycle will set you back by around 3,90,000 rupees ex showroom. Well, this particular colour scheme, the all black, will set you back by 4 lakh rupees. And the most expensive is the one to be had in red. Well, that will set you back by 4 lakh 10,000 rupees. Uh, not all that cheap in today's motorcycling standards and you can get a lot more motorcycle, a lot more bang for your buck elsewhere in the market. But what this motorcycle brings to the table, it's stellar looks, good fit and finish, well the engine, the tractability, belt driven, V-twin motor, 300cc, good amount of power, good road manners. Well, it is a very enjoyable motorcycle, all in all, but then again, it is lacking a certain amount of features. Then there is the question about uh, reliability, well, because in all honesty, we haven't ridden Kiwi motorcycles around for a long time to check on their longevity and their durability. So there is a big question mark looming above that. And then you have something like the Super Meteor 650, which gives you a lot more motorcycle for a lot cheaper. So basically, in terms of pricing and its stature in the market, this pretty much sits in no man's land. But the biggest setback of this motorcycle has to be that price tag. With that, it's time for us to wrap up this week's edition of Overdrive. But remember, you can stay in touch with the team through Facebook, Twitter, as well as YouTube. And you can follow our latest updates on Instagram. We'll see you next week. Until then, goodbye. Many thanks for watching.